Hello, my name is Cody Price and I just want to welcome everyone. It is now 1 o'clock so we'll begin our presentation shortly. Today on March 18th we'll have our uh, presentation on special assessments, create special benefits, avoiding an unconstitutional taking given by Ben Orsman. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box and we'll be able to answer those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of our participating chapters, divisions, and universities and I just want to um, do a personal thank you to the Western Central Chapter for sponsoring today's webcast. For our upcoming webcast, our next one will be on March 25th for Planning for an Aging Society, Technologies for Safe Transportation Mobility, and that will end our March webcast series, and then we'll start up again on April 1st on new tools for public participation, possibilities, and pitfalls, and then we'll have a few more throughout April, and you'll be able to find a complete listing for 2011, and to register for these events, please go to www.utah-apa.org slash webcast, and you'll be able to find uh, the complete listing, and you can select your, select your webcast of choice um, to register for. Um, to log your CM credits for attending today's session, you'll need to go to www.planning.org slash CM, select activities by date, and then underneath March 18th, you'll see special assessments create special benefits avoiding an unconstitutional taking and this is listed underneath the Western Central chapter and so um, this is uh, logged and up already and so after today's session you'll be able to um, log those credits and then we are recording today's session and so you'll be able to find a video recording and a PDF of today's webinar at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast um, dash archive and then this should be up by Monday. Um, so as of right now I will now like to hand it over to Pepper who will be introducing our speaker for today. Thank you Cody. Welcome everybody. Good morning. My name is Pepper McClenahan. I'm the Professional Development Officer for the Western Central Chapter and I'd like to welcome Ben Orsbon, um, FAICP, who is our speaker today. Ben is a Special Assistant to the Secretary for Policy and Legislation of the South Dakota Department of Transportation. He is on the Board of Directors and a founder of the Western Planning Resources Incorporated, a private nonprofit organization educating and training planners in 14 Western states. He was educated as an environmental and land use planner and has over 30 years of experience in transportation and state and local planning. He has a Master's of Regional Planning degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Ben enjoys singing, downhill skiing, backpacking, and most things outdoors. Uh, his presentation today will focus on the theory and reality of balancing special assessment fees with the special benefit that must be received by the assessee to avoid a taking. It will also discuss organizing neighborhoods for action, preparing to become a witness, and the AICP Code of Ethics as it relates to this topic. He was a witness, a community organizer, an assessee, and a petitioner in the case, questioning the city's approach that he'll be discussing today. And this discussion will be mostly from an assessee or uh, petitioner's perspective. So with that, please help me in welcoming Ben Orsman. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. I think I may have just closed the PowerPoint. We'll see if we can get it back up. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll begin. Good afternoon to everyone on Eastern Time. Good morning to everyone on the mountain in the Pacific, and I'm sorry to make you miss lunch if you're on Central Time, but we'll uh, get started right away with the details. The focus of the presentation today will be on a recent curb and gutter assessment case decided by the South Dakota Supreme Court on June 30th, 2010. We'll discuss the general legal principles for special assessment to avoid a taking 
AICP ethics consideration, neighborhood organizing and steering, and lessons learned. I'll begin with a short overview of special assessments and a short definition. Special assessment is formally defined as a fee government may levy on property owners to fund a public project which creates a benefit reflected by, by the market value of properties lying within a special assessment district. Basically, if government funds make a property more valuable, the government can recover from each property owner a portion of the cost consistent with the private benefit created. Landowners must benefit directly, uniquely, and specifically from the public project. Some states may define benefit to be more than an increase in market value. Benefit may mean a special adaptability of the land or a relief from some burden, but it should influence the value. You know, assessment charges can be levied against land for installing drinking water lines and sewer lines, street paving, police or fire protection, parking structures, street lighting, and many of the other purposes permitted by state and local statutes. Defining the boundaries of the district so that the properties are measurably benefited is an art. If the condition, in this case, of existing curb and gutter is already good, improvement of the existing infrastructure will have a negligible impact on existing property values and existing benefits. Under those circumstances, re replacement of functioning curb and gutter probably would not increase local benefits. The objectives of the presentation will really be to focus on the case Wade and Lisa Hubbard et al. versus the city of Pier. It is a curb and gutter case, but it goes beyond curb and gutter in terms of the lessons that you can learn and the guidance that it provides in terms of special assessment. Some fundamental questions and so forth of the case and what it answers is what is the primary function of curb and gutter and is it part of the street? What are the benefits from initial construction of curb and gutter compared to replacing function of curb and gutter? What is the magnitude of the benefit of replacement for the SSE and what is its magnitude in relationship to the assessment fee? Is using cost per linear front foot to establish the assessment fee speculative and conjectural, which is a legal test for taking? This presentation will answer fundamental questions to help the audience avoid the pitfalls of unconstitutional special assessment. The assessment does not have to be for new construction or new services. In our case, it was for replacement. And like I said before, this is a South Dakota Supreme Court case uh, on an assessment levied by the city of Pierre. Okay. Excuse me, Ben. I'm yes. sorry to break in, but we're having a lot of comments. People are having a very difficult time hearing you. It sounds like you're in a tin can, that you're too far away from the microphone, that you're garbled. Can you see if you can make some adjustments to maybe get a little bit better um, voice uh, audio across and also have you advanced your slide from slide one yet because if you have people yes. are not seeing your you have advanced your slide yes people I'm on slide number four now uh, we're not seeing that um, are you um, are you on the, are you running it from the slideshow because the screen that we have up is yes. Yes, I am. Should I end the show and come back in? No, don't end it. Um, underneath screen sharing on the toolbar, is that is the play button? Um, press like show my screen, or is it still paused? I can't see it because I've got the full screen up. Well, can you exit out of that? Like press escape, and then um, get to that. Sorry I'll about this, everyone. I'll have to end the show to do it. Well, yeah, the PowerPoint Just, presentation. If you press 
it's escape it'll okay I've done that and it's showing uh, the fourth slide now okay I'll go ahead and make you the presenter again because I think what happened is just that it got paused in your screen and so so if you can just click the show my screen button okay. again okay and then hopefully this will fix things are we ready to start from the beginning again yes okay can you see it now yes and should I minimize the portion over here on the right yeah just click the orange button with the white arrow and then that should just minimize it for you. And then you can go ahead and get started with your presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, this is the slide that I'm on now, the fourth slide. And we're going to talk about the primary function of curve and gutter and whether it's part of the street. Uh, like I said before, the outcome might have been very different had the case been for initial construction of curve and gutter instead of replacement curve and gutter because of the different benefits. The facts of the case were the assessment fee was the contractor's cost per front linear foot of curb and gutter. And the primary purpose of the entire project was to replace water mains, which involved reconstructing the street and replacing portions of the curb and gutter. Adjacent landowners were assessed the contractor's cost per linear foot per curb and gutter and driveway replacement and assessed only for that, not for streets or anything else, only curb and gutter. The rest was paid by the city. The, the city assessed over $160,000 for curb and gutter and driveways. The ultimate question in this case is, did the assessees receive, at a minimum, a fair approximation of special benefits relative to the amount of the assessment? Otherwise, a limited number of assessees financed improvements for the benefit of the public at large, when a broad-based fee or a tax would have been more appropriate. Such an action is an unconstitutional taking. The Fifth Amendment states that private property cannot be taken for public use without just compensation. The courts consider the assessment compensation in some form a positive outcome for the property owner. The linear foot assessment method costs the same per foot to every landowner, no matter if the curb was built last year or 50 years ago, except for the differences in, in the linear front footage of the lot. Hypothetically, curb and gutter could re be replaced every year at full cost using this approach. Some of the curb had been replaced at least twice since 1986. Concrete curb should have at least 50 years of service life, but no financial adjustment occurred based on differences in depreciation and life cycles. Graphically, you can describe it as is shown in the attached figure. As you see where I'm pointing here, this would be the benefit uh, that you can constitutionally capture in an assessment fee structure. Private or special benefits may or may not exist, and determining and measuring the benefit is difficult. And this graph we're basically showing that there is private benefit uh, at this level, and the difference between that and the public benefit uh, is basically uh, this portion right here that I'm pointing to, 
And this can be assessed if the benefit is present. Uh, the benefit here that I'm showing is basically the current benefit without any replacement at all. And this line may be sloping upward. It may uh, slope downward depending on if you have significant deterioration or so forth over time with the curve and gutter you're replacing. But this kind of gives you a, a visual uh, aspect to what benefit you can constitutionally capture if it is present. But all of this within this area here on this graph can be captured constitutionally if it exists. I'm going to show you a few pictures of the neighborhood uh, where the assessment occurred. Uh, this is a, a basically a picture of our house in the center of a postcard used by the city of the Pier Chamber of Commerce. It's in a historic district at Pier, and it's a very nice old neighborhood. But uh, you can see this is our house right here. The other, this is the adjacent house. This house was uh, appeared this summer in this old house magazine. Uh, and you can see this what a neighbor what a nice neighborhood it is. This is a 1909 house right here. I'm showing you now a picture of the old curb and gutter in front of my house. It has pavement that's over what's called a gutter pan. And this is the gutter pan. And there was some question by the city of whether or not uh, the gutter pan was solid, whether there was leaking of water through the gutter pan into uh, the sub-base of the street and so forth. Uh, but this is a picture of our curb right in front of our house with the pavement extending somewhat over the gutter pan. But as you can see, uh, there's no cracks in this gutter pan. This is a picture of the new curb and gutter that replaced it, but it's almost exactly the same location. Uh, you can see here that there's no pavement extending over the gutter pan, but in terms of its condition and so forth, and its strength, they appear to be very similar. We were asked to pay slightly less than $1,000 for the difference between these two curbs and gutters in our assessment. Here's another view extending outward from that initial curb and gutter that I showed you of the, of the old curb and gutter. But you can see here um, the gutter pan is still structurally sound all through this segment with many years of service life left. Like I said before, 50 years is, is probably a good estimate of of the service life that should exist from concrete curb and gutter. Here's another view looking in the opposite direction. You can see once again that the gutter pan is pretty solid and the curb itself is very solid. Uh, there's no significant cracks other than uh, expansion cracks that were built into the gutter uh, initially to make sure that it had room to expand without cracking and breaking it up. Here's a view of the curb and gutter after the uh, pavement was removed and the water line was being installed. And this shows the view of the gutter pan with no uh, pavement existing adjacent to it. And you can see here that there's no cracks in the gutter pan. Here's another view of the exposed curb and gutter that's basically uh, showing the same thing. Another view showing the same thing. This is a close-up of the curb and gutter, showing the aggregate that's used in, in our curb and gutter. And this was pink, this pink stone here is limestone aggregate that can only come from the Black Hills in South Dakota. So it was not you know, inexpensive local aggregate, aggregate that you get from a glacial gravel pit or something like that in, in the area. Uh, the Black Hills are more than 180 miles from here. Uh, and 
and much of the oldest curve and gutter had local gravel, which was kind of different than our curve. Here's a picture of some of the other uh, curve and gutter, and it does show some significant differences in condition. You'll see here there's a chunk that looks like it might be close to falling out. There has been a chunk that has fallen out here. Uh, there's some cracks, noticeable cracks that you can see in this curve. Uh, this is the, the, the neighbor with the house uh, that's just adjacent to us. Uh, and he wanted his curving gutter replaced and was willing to pay full cost for the replacement. And his condition, as you can see, is very different from uh, what the curving gutter that my wife and I have. But you notice that the curb gutter pan and drainage would still function here. That there's not any significant cracking or so forth that you could see that water would still uh, flow. Here's another view of some other curb and gutter uh, showing some cracking in this general area here. But you can still see that the curb and gutter pan would still allow water to flow. Here's another view uh, a little bit further down and you can see that this curve and gutter shows some more deterioration and some obvious replacement which occurred because of the lateral offset that you can see in this area right here. Uh, the photos that I'm showing you here were not the only neighborhood affected. There were uh, three neighborhoods, and then the two other neighborhoods, some of the curving gutter was only partially replaced, and a front foot fee was only applied for the curving gutter that was replaced. So they were trying, at least in some instances, outside of our neighborhood, where the water line and the street was not being replaced, of trying to use some of the existing. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the function of curb and gutter uh, and show you some of the references and so forth that verify those functions. But the American Public Works Association publications basically say that curb and gutter reduces pavement failure, it controls drainage, aids street cleaning and snow plowing, reduces required right of way, and promotes safety. The American Concrete Paving Association says it reduces the water under the pavement, combines pavement structures, combines low-speed traffic within the pavement. The American Association of State High provides drainage control, roadway edge delineation, wider way requirements are reduced, and improves aesthetics. It delineates pedestrian walkways, controls access to the street, reduces maintenance. The American Society of Civil Engineers, the National Association of Home Builders, and the Urban Lands Institute says that it controls drainage, protects pavement edges and sidewalks and lawns from vehicles. Uh, based on these references, which are leading authorities, it would be difficult to find a private purpose other than aesthetics, reducing right of way, and keeping vehicles off lawns. Most of the other purposes are primarily public, and in sense essence related to street preservation and maintenance. Modern stormwater management is actually promoting eliminating curves in many residential environments and going back to a vegetative depression that allows stormwater infiltration into the groundwater. Pavement edge support with granite or concrete retainers at the pavement surface level provides the pavement edge support and supports the increased pavement life that would come from a curve even though it doesn't exist uh, except through that edge support by not allowing the pavement edges to break off as easily. I'm going now into the, the case law, or the state statutes, pardon me, 
that seem to be the primary culprits here and the heart of the matter and the point of confusion, I think, for the city that led to this case to begin with. South Dakota codified law 943-7 says the total benefit of the improvement shall be deemed to be not less than the total cost thereof. And such total costs shall constitute the amount to be apportioned and shall include the contract price and all the engineering, inspection, publication, fiscal, legal, and other expenses incidental there too. And this is basically a section in the assessment chapter that says the city can capture all of those costs. And this was the city choice that they really hung their hat on in terms of their Defense. South Dakota codified law 94530 says the cost may be assessed to a budding property by front foot and the total cost may be divided by the number of feet fronting or abutting the project. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking and I think uh, the, the circuit court and the Supreme Court in our case said the two may be intended more for new development and special benefits must be available here in order to make this appropriate. And this final section of codified law, I think, really verifies this. South Dakota codified law 94532 says instead of the method prescribed in 94530 and 31, the cost may be assessed according to the benefits determined by the governing body. Each lot shall be assessed the amount in which each lot will be especially benefited such amount shall not exceed said benefit. The city's primary reliance on 43.7 may be the biggest shortcoming of the city's approach. Applied procedures, and I think they applied procedures for new streets through replacement curb and gutter. The law does show that 45.7 can be used for total cost, but it, you must look at the entire chapter and not just one section. 45.30 allows for cost by front foot, and 4532 says it may be assessed according to the benefits determined by the governing body in an amount not to exceed the benefit. You have to ask, what is the spirit of the entire chapter? I met with the mayor, the city administrator, the city engineer, and the engineering technician and explained the condition of my curb and gutter, but they would not make exceptions, nor would they treat our property any differently, even though the conditions of the curb and gutter and gutter were different. They were convinced that 4530 was all they needed. The bottom line is that no matter which section or sections are applied, they have to be applied so the outcome is consistent with constitutional requirements. So that this was there was way too much reliance on a particular section by the city not enough investigation into all the statutes and the case law. The most significant point is that state statutes do not trump the U.S. and state constitution. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the national and regional case law. The foremost case is the village of Norwood versus Baker, which is a U.S. Supreme Court case in 19, or 1898. It basically said assessment in substantial excess of special benefits is a payment. The excess is taxation on private property for public use. In Katzban versus the city of Granville, which was a Michigan case, the court said you have to prove you did not receive special benefit because of the presumption of validity of the city ordinance. In essence, the city uh, Ordinance is presumed to be valid unless you can prove you did not receive special benefit. In the Dixon Road Group versus the City of Novi, which was a Michigan case in 1986, the court said the benefit must be financial, resulting from an increased market value of the land. It must relieve it from a burden or make it specifically adaptable to a purpose which enhances its value and is reflected in that value. In Goodall versus the city of Clinton, which was an Iowa case, the court said a 
approximation of assessments and then of assessment and benefits is all that can be reasonably expected. The plaintiffs should not pay for those benefits accruing to the community at large, but should pay for what they receive. St. Clair County Home Builders Association versus the City of Pell City, which is a 2010 case uh, in Alabama, and it was a user fee instead of case instead of a special assessment case. The court said the user fee only has to be a fair approximation of the benefit. Cats ban the assessment basically is invalid only if there is a substantial or unreasonable disproportionality between the amount assessed and the value which accrues to the land as a result of the improvements. The defendants must present credible evidence to rebut the presumption that the assessments are valid to contest the assessment. In Dixon Road, the assessment is considered fair if it considers the value of realty benefited and is proportioned to the property assessed. There must be a reasonable relationship between the assessment amount and the amount of the benefit. In the Dixon Road case, the hearing officer ruled that the allocated costs to the assessees for the improvements were approximately 2.6 times the increase in value that the, improvement, that the improvements would confer upon the parcels assessed. In the St. Clair case, uh, it does give one pause, even though it is a user fee case, because of the great freedom given to cities in the fair approximation concept. The real question is, what benefit does replacing functioning curb and gutter provide? This is the fundamental question the court had to answer in this case. But there is the presumption that the city ordinance is valid, and the assessees must prove that it is invalid to have a case. In the South Dakota case law, which I'm showing on the next slide, uh, these are all Supreme Court cases, South Dakota Supreme Court cases. In the city of Brookings versus Associated Developers, the court said, there must be a special benefit to the assessees different from that accruing to the public at large. The fees must be apportioned according to the value of the benefit conferred, and the assessment statutes must be strictly construed in favor of the property owner. So you can see in South Dakota that there's a little bit more of a uh, conservative lean, I guess, to the court. And they're saying that the, that the assessment statutes must be construed in favor of the property owner as opposed to uh, the city uh, and the benefits and so forth that the city gets from the presumption of validity of, validity of its ordinance. In Hawley versus case, the court said the special benefit must be different than the benefit the public at large enjoys. In Rule versus Granite City, which was a 69 case, the court said the benefit must be above and beyond that enjoyed in common with the public at large or the rest of the community, and the benefits should not be diffused throughout the community. The benefits must be actual, physical, and material, and not merely speculative or conjectural. The Supreme Court, the South Dakota Supreme Court, has some very specific elements that is used to determine the constitutionality of special assessments, and they've required some rigor on the part of the cities in estimating special benefits. In terms of the case itself in circuit court, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we made our case in the relevant testimony. The assessee's witnesses were basically the county assessor, a real estate appraiser, a realtor, um, Hubbard, who was the primary person on the, the case name, and I, the presenter. The county assessor basically said there's no increase in property value due to replace curb and gutter, but it would increase value for initial construction. The real estate appraiser said there's no increase in property due to replace curb and gutter, but it is difficult to determine value from replacement. He would have to look at each property to determine
determine if the parcel received a benefit. The realtor basically said the age of curb and gutter and replacement makes no difference in a property sale value and is not a factor in the sale. That's what she said. Hubbard said there was no increase in value of his home and his wife's home as a result of that. But since he was a, a landowner and a and the SSE, you've got to take that with a grain of salt, no doubt. My testimony basically was not so much associated with value, but I described uh, that curb and gutter is a public capital improvement benefiting the entire municipality. It primarily aids drainage and keeps water out of the base of the street, increasing street life and prolonging its function. I also said that our curb and gutter was in good condition a minimum of 30 years of remaining life. Special assessment, I also said special assessment is not unconstitutional, but it must be defendable against unconstitutional claims by providing special benefits with some reasonable connection to the assessment fee. The assessee's witnesses really found no increase in value from replacing curb and gutter or that it was difficult to determine the value. I basically spoke about how different assessments and fees work based on new construction and replacement. There must be some special benefit connected to the assessment fee, and the benefit needs to be similar to the, to the level of the fee. The city's witnesses basically said uh, in particular the city engineer, that he agreed with public curb and gutter function, but that it could keep water from private pot, uh, property, possibly a private function. He also said curb and gutter replaced, was replaced primarily because of the water line replacement and street construction. He said curb elevations and consequently drainage would not be consistent to facilitate drainage from one property to another, so all the curb and gutter had to re be replaced regardless of condition. They also testified he could see nothing wrong with the presented curb and gutter. The engineering technician said, also said he could see nothing wrong with the presenter's curb and gutter. But he did say, you know, there's possible benefit to the owner from uniform elevation. And elevation changes in gutter would not allow property drainage without full replacement of everyone's curb and gutter. The former, former mayor said it's very difficult to place a dollar value and quantify landowners' benefits, but it creates an intangible value. Intangible seems to me to be very close to speculative and conjectural. It has, and he also said it has always been done that was to uh, save general fund money. The primary purpose for curb and gutter replacement, once again, was the replacement of the water line and the repaving of the street. Quantification of the contractor's cost was not quantification of the benefit to the adjacent property owner. The city may have confused construction impact fees or exactions with special assessment or a general citywide or a general citywide fee or tax for replacement would have been more appropriate. At a minimum, the benefits must be a fair approximation of the assessment fee, as was described in 945.32, where it says, each lot shall be assessed the amount in which each lot will be especially benefited, and such amount shall not exceed said benefit. Nor would uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court case present a high standard, and the state case is an even higher one relative to the benefits to be received. City witnesses showed a lot of ugly curb and gutter for about an hour and a half in part as part of their testimony, and much of it was in other neighborhoods. One pitcher had a board behind the curb holding the soil from leaking through, but the gutter pan was solid and the street base was drained and protected. Once again, the city engineer and the, and the engineering technician could find nothing wrong with my curb and gutter. In the city's case, uh, and their witnesses after 
we were done with our presentation of evidence. The city engineer and the engineering technician described and showed many examples of curb and gutter in poor condition. Uh, they showed numerous photos primarily showing defects, not the entire sections to be replaced. They said calculating curb and gutter driveway fee amounts based on each property's linear, linear front footage allowed the replacement to be tailored to the individual needs and benefits to each property owner. They were cautious not to impose unreasonable expense on landowners so they did not charge more than the linear front foot fee per curb and gutter and driveway replacement. And most properties were assessed a different amount because they had a different front linear frontage. The city's legal counsel basically said state statutes allowed such a practice because some of the state chapter sections specifically referred to. And the city emphasized in the testimony the damage to private property that could result without functioning curb and gutter, like infiltration of water into lawn, lawn depression, erosion, vehicles leaving the roadway, etc. They disagreed with the assessees and the level of preci precision needed in determining benefits. And that was understandable since they used a very simple, simple method. They argued that cost per linear foot for curb and gutter and for driveway approaches was not speculative and conjectural and was close enough to approximate the benefit. Once again, they emphasized the lawn damage that could occur from water infiltration and they thought that any rough approximation of value was okay in assessment. It did not have to have precision or rigorous estimation methods behind it. The presumption of validity creates a high bar for contesting any decision of the city, but it does not protect arbitrary and un un unreasonable decisions. I'm going to talk a little bit about the rules of evidence here because this was my first time to ever be in court and it might be helpful to at least uh, some of the planners who've never had to defend anything like this to go through a little bit of what I learned in that regard. The, the most important point is there's no do-overs. That all evidence and arguments must be presented at circuit court and nothing new could be presented and no new argument, arguments after that point. In hindsight, we assessees should have taken more widely distributed photos of functioning curb and gutter throughout the affected neighborhoods as a result of that. More and better photos would have showed varying conditions of deterior deterioration and the weakness of a linear foot approach to establishing benefit. Fair and balanced testimony increases credibility and agreeing up front constitutional was helpful. Acknowledging property may receive benefit from replacing curb and gutter if it is not functioning and deteriorating may have also helped. Presenting the three types of fees, those being special assessments, general fees, and development exactions or impact fees, clarify differences of appropriateness under proper circumstances. Being AICP was helpful along with experience with pavement management and curb functions, which I do have as part of my background. But lacking engineering testimony, and I'm not a PE, uh, I'm just ed trained as a planner, uh, lacking engineering testimony on the assessing side, the highly credible engineering reference was shown previously documenting the public functions of curb and gutter were extremely helpful. The Sixth Judicial Circuit Court ruling basically said that special assessments must be strictly construed in favor of the property owner. The city estimated benefits are assumed to be correct, and this presumption can be overcome only by a strong, direct, clear, and positive proof. The benefit must be measured by the amount the improvement causes the property to increase in value and also the special benefit beyond what the public in general enjoy. Such special benefit was shown to result, no or no such 
special benefit was shown to result from the replacement of turbine gutter. The old turbine gutter provided benefits because it was still functioning, and the assessees enjoyed the same benefits shared by the city and the community as a whole. The court basically implied the cost per linear foot, foot, foot was not sufficient approximation of the benefits received, and the method was speculative and conjectural. It relied heavily on the logic of uh, 945.32, which once again said each lot shall be assessed the amount in which each lot will be especially benefited, and such amount shall not exceed such benefit. In summary, the South Dakota Circuit Court found that replacing the curve and gutter provided no special benefits, and that the assessment was levied using spe speculative and conjectural methods in excess of the increase in specific monetary value conferred for a project that provided significant benefits to the city and the community as a whole. That was not the end of the, of the case by any means, and the city appealed uh, the case to the South Dakota Supreme Court. And the claim that the circuit court aired by misinterpreting um, 4530 and 4532. Once again, 4530 was the linear front foot method, which the city preferred. 4532 was the special benefit method, which the SSE preferred. They also said that the circuit court erred by not giving proper deference to the city's special assessment, in essence, the pres presumption of validity and also by concluding that the assessees did not receive a special benefit beyond that enjoyed by the public. The South Dakota Supreme Court said in their rule that the city argued in their Supreme Court brief that South Dakota 4530 required no showing of special benefit. But the Supreme Court held the circuit court did not err in focusing on whether a special benefit was received. The city attorneys also agreed that they must show special benefits during questioning from the Supreme Court justices during oral arguments. Their position didn't last long under the uh, questioning by the justices. A special assessment can be constitutionally imposed if the assessment does not exceed the benefit received. If the benefit is local in nature, a cost can be assessed against adjacent property if the property receives a special benefit. If both general and local benefits are involved, only part of the cost of the project can be assessed to the adjacent property owner. The circuit court, court gave, they also said that the circuit court gave proper deference to the But because the city assessment method violated constitutional principles, it was by its very nature arbitrary, unreasonable, and beyond its authority. Evidence was considered, and, and it was not mere assertions and plausible contentions, and this is their language, and frivolous avowals. The city's quantification of the benefits were ambiguous and conclusory, and that the benefits, that the benefits equal the cost. The court said its ruling should not be broadly interpreted, however, that special assessments cannot be used to finance replacement urban gutters. That depends on the nature and character of the project. The uh, link I'm showing down there is a link to the Supreme Court case, and that will be included in the presentation of PDF. In summary, Basically, the presumption of validity only goes so far. The Supreme Court wanted to limit the effect of the ruling, implying it was mostly factually based. The linkage to the private function of curb and gutter is a key in its constitutionality. This is a real lesson to keep in mind in all special assessments. How much of the function is public and how much is private? And how can you separate your estimates of the public benefits from the private benefits for each landowner. Those are critical things to consider. 
I'll talk briefly about the AICP ethical considerations that came into play, uh, at least in my mind, when I was considering the case. One of those is to provide timely, adequate, clear, and accurate information to all affected. Many of the local citizens, lawyers, city officials, and others were not aware of the gray legal areas of the cities in the city's assessment practice and its questionable constitutionality. The practice had not been challenged and it was enacted in 1986. Since people, uh, you also have to give people the opportunity to have meaningful impact and include those lacking formal organization and influence. Many of the affected were on fixed income, elderly, or otherwise disadvantaged, and the large assessment fee with little prior notice was a hardship to many. Most, many of those were not in our neighborhood, but the two other uh, The other principle, seek social justice, recognizing a special responsibility plan for the needs of the disadvantaged, and urge the alteration of policies and decisions that oppose such needs. There did not appear to be an unbiased consideration of the facts and legal precedents by the city, but because of a long history of the old linear foot assessment practice, and they were not open to a new approach. The other principle to deal fairly with all participants in the planning process. Many curb and gutters in good condition were being replaced, and no financial adjustment from the contractor's cost for linear foot were ever offered to the presenter's knowledge. There were many AICP ethics issues involved in this case. We know that dental work and some surgeries were postponed by some of the residents that covered the assessment fee while this litigation was occurring. There was no prior notice other than uh, the requirements for public notice so that poorer residents could save up to pay the fee. 10% per year charge was levied on all late assessment fees. We think that the city could have been more understanding. Just to give you an example, uh, the assessment for our property was $965 uh, dollars to replace our curb and gutter, even though it was in relatively good condition. Now I'm going to talk briefly about the neighborhood organizing and how we went about uh, requiring fee, legal fees for the case. All assessees were mailed an invitation to a meeting with our potential legal counsel to discuss the lawsuit. There are 151 affected properties. Our attorney explained the legal issues and our prospects of winning the dispute at the meeting. A sign-up list was circulated and potential litigants were identified. And contribute a portion of the legal fee based on their front footing. 42 of the 151 affected properties joined the lawsuit. Wade Hubbard, the primary litigant and a lawyer, and another late neighborhood lawyer and I agreed to assist with legal briefs to control the cost. A seven-member steering committee was formed from the participants to direct the process and to help stir the, uh, to steer the case and and so forth and keep the residents informed at all stages of the process. The legal fees amounted to about 18.5% of the original assessment, or about $4.63 per linear foot, compared to an assessment fee of about $41.50. But the money was secondary to protecting the Constitution and the legal and ethical issues protect the underprivileged and others on fixed income. We had a very transparent and open and participatory process, and we tried to keep participants informed at all the critical steps. We had to go back to the assessees once more for money to cover the additional attorney's fees uh, because we didn't assess enough to begin with, but the total was the $4.63 that I discussed. But the attorney and the neighborhood lawyers did everything they could to control the cost. And we used email significantly to communicate uh, with the assessees. 
in terms of assessment guidance and general lessons you could provide uh, in any assessment case beyond this to curve the other, I would uh, say that you need to know the fund per fundamental purpose of the assessment and the infrastructure or service you are trying to finance. It's the primary public or purpose, public or private, and what proportion for each affected property. Don't paint with too broad a brush and generalize to each property. You need to examine each property individually. Before you assess, you need to ask, will the improvement for which the assessment is to be levied perform as it did before replacement? Or is there some new additional special benefit that will accrue exclusively to only the assessee? If you struggle to answer yes to this question, don't assess. If you are estimating the benefits of special assessment, err on the side of rough proportionality with the assessment fee. The closer the assessment fee is to the actual benefit conferred to each property, the more defendable the assessment becomes. Make sure the outcome primarily benefits the local or adjacent owners if a special assessment is being used instead of a general citywide fee. You have to ask what is the real improvement or change in benefits to each property that will result from the assessment and will it be reflected in the appraiser's or the county assessor's valuation. Make sure you have a method to calculate at least a fair approximation special benefits. In South Dakota, the assessment should be the amount the property is specially benefited based upon 4532. Otherwise, a broad-based general infrastructure maintenance fee or a tax is appropriate. And I'm going to leave you with a maybe a little bit more of a hypothetical here, but could a city's curb and gutter or any other public infrastructure be so dilapidated, dilapidated and aesthetically unpleasing that it would adversely affect the value of adjacent property. And couldn't any public infrastructure in poor condition do that? And if so, could, and more importantly, should a special assessment be applied? If municipal revenues continue to decline, this issue may become more common. You should be able to prematurely demolish any infrastructure with any service light remaining and then fully assess to replace it. Otherwise, you could have an absurd conclusion year after year of charging assessment fees and replacing good curb and gutter. As the Dixon case said, there must be a reasonable relationship between the amount of the assessment and the amount of the benefit. And the final left you with really brings up some real issues regarding sustainability and priorities for a city. There should, where should revenues be directed first? Preservation or expansion? What are the fundamental purposes for cities regarding health, safety, and welfare? And there are many answers and there's quite a little bit of gray area in that regard. In summing up, I've talked about the legal principles for special assessment, AICP ethics considerations, neighborhood organizing and steering, and lessons learned. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, it was a great presentation. We do have some questions, so if um, if you'll stand by, I'll read those to you for your answers. We're still getting some folks that are saying they're having a difficult time hearing you. Um, so if you could speak in into the microphone and um, speak up just a little bit, hopefully that will help. Um, the first question is, would it also be accurate to say that to the extent they aid in street cleaning, curbs and gutters also help to preserve and minimize maintenance costs of stormwater drainage? I would say probably, uh, because if you didn't have curb and gutters existing to facilitate storm water drainage, you might have more erosion 
and so forth than if you used uh, what, I, what I would describe as ditch, ditch depressions and so forth. Uh, that would definitely be a consideration. Uh, you might be able to line the bottom of the ditches with stone or some other thing that would hold uh, the vegetation such that uh, it wouldn't erode as much, but it probably would reduce uh, stormwater maintenance costs. Okay. Our next question is, in the south, uh, actually it's mostly a comment, in the south very little curb is provided in the mid-century neighborhoods. Um, it said, I like curb and gutter better for the look, but it's not always available, um, and maintenance in, no, in older neighborhoods seems to be a problem due to the cost. So I don't know if you have any comments on that, Ben. Well, that's, I think that's a valid uh, point really wasn't framed as a question. For instance, my brother lives in the South. He lives in the city of Charlotte uh, and in a neighborhood in the southern part of the city. And there are no curbs uh, and gutters in his neighborhood. And it's a relatively uh, high-end neighborhood. Um, and they maintain everything with ditch, ditch sections and so forth there in terms of stormwater drainage. Uh, and the point that the uh, questioner made about the maintenance costs associated with curb and gutter, it shouldn't be that high, high a cost to maintain once it's constructed because of its, if, particularly if it's concrete or granite like you see it in uh, uh, the District of Columbia, for instance, because its service life should be somewhere close to 50 years. Uh, unless you're having snow plows hitting it or some other disruption, or you have uh, utility cuts and that kind of thing that are occurring through you know, solid and, and good uh, condition curb and gutter, there really shouldn't be that much of a problem with maintenance costs until it gets to the uh, end of its service life. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Ben. I'm cutting and pasting questions that are coming in as we go here. The next question is, was the drainage basin of the community looked at as part of the public-private benefit? Uh, that's a little bit unclear to me. Uh, if you're trying to, in most cases, curb and gutter expedites storm drainage. And that can have both positive and negative effects. It increases the speed of the of the drainage uh, from storm water infiltration, which curb uh, basically uh, restricts. As a result of that, you know you might have more flooding and so forth associated with curb and gutter than you would if you had. Uh, stormwater infiltration. Uh, that was not a significant consideration in our case because stormwater drainage is, is handled relatively easily within our city and it's never been an issue in our drainage basin. If you were in a, a drainage basin, large drainage basin with not a lot of elevation differential, uh, which you could have in, in flatter areas and so forth, where you would expedite stormwater flow, uh, curb and gutter might actually be an impediment because of increasing uh, the speed of flood waters in stormwater drainage. We also have a, another question that's similar to that. It says, was part of the city's discussion relative to storm uh, to water runoff from private property into the area of the curb and gutter, i.e. cellar drain sub um, sub pumps, roof leaders, uh, distributing the curb and gutter, and how would this relate to current MS4 requirements in certain areas? Yeah. I'm not sure what MS4 requirements are, but in most of the instances that we're talking about here, uh, 
all of the lawns would basically have provided infiltration for the runoff from all of the properties. None of none of the properties in our neighborhood, for instance, that I am aware of, ever have had any of the drainage from the roofs into the street. Uh, there could be some uh, drainage, I think, from roofs. If you had your, say, your short, your uh, gutter down flow or so, or something like that, that would go immediately into a driveway and that type of thing, which fed into the street, that would definitely be an issue that would expedite uh, the drainage and have storm water flowing into the curb and the gutter. Uh, at a more rapid rate. But in most of the instances in our historic neighborhood, the um, gutters and so forth just go onto the lawns so that we can water our lawns with the, with the uh, rainwater. And it is a relatively dry climate uh, compared to uh, you know eastern climates. So that kind of thing, uh, rainfall and Gutter drainage is actually a benefit in most instances in, in our part of the world. Right, and somebody also questioned, doesn't the curb and gutter also assist in snow removal? So that's kind of an ancillary part of so some it, of the previous discussion. Uh, in our case, it generally gets covered up by snow removal. Uh, if I could go back to that other slide, I could show you that. It does facilitate drainage once the snow starts to melt, but uh, the, the snows are generally deep enough until it's kind of difficult to determine where the location of the curb and gutter. So they stay away from the curb and gutter uh, in our neighborhood probably by a foot and a half to two feet would be my guess based, based on the way I look at it. Having, you know, working for a South Dakota Department of Transportation, I can tell you that the curb and gutter and other obstructions like that can sometimes make it difficult for plow drivers because of not being able to see and determine exactly where the location of the curb is. If their plow blade hits that curb, it can throw them uh, and actually causes accidents in, in some instances. For, in the, for example, if you have uh, something like a curb and or a median, and it's, the snow's so deep you can't really determine where the boundary is, if your plow blade hits that, uh, we've had several plows that have had accidents as a result of that. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I'm not sure how to put this question in context, but at um, earlier in your presentation somebody asked, would you expect the same logic and law could be a applied to driveway aprons. Yes, and it was. When I talk about curb and gutter, uh, everything that I basically described to you was actually uh, considered in the driveway aprons. And they actually charged for driveway aprons as a part of the curb and gutter replacement. The fee was different because of the, the cost per linear foot was a little different but they actually did charge for that. And it was all built into the special assessment, but at a slightly different rate. OK, great. One of the participants also wanted to, you to describe how many neighbors contributed to the lawsuit. Uh, I think I actually had that documented in one of the slides. Go back to home. Uh, 142 of the 151 properties or 68 people. And some of those people were like joint household owners, though, like my wife and I. But there were uh, 68 people and 42 of 151 affected properties that participated in the lawsuit. Okay, great. Somebody asked an ethics question. Uh, they asked, where do you work? Would you have challenged the city if you worked for the city? And what AICP ethics issues would that have presented? 
<laughs> I didn't know. I might have been looking for a job if I had been employed with the city. Uh, but that's definitely a, a consideration uh, that you'd have to make uh, as an ethical determination on your part. I think the least that you should be required to do, and that's initially what we did, even though uh, we were not employed by the city, uh, is both Mr. Hubbard and I presented most of the case law that you've seen at the public meetings before the special assessment enrollment decision was voted upon by the city council. And we basically uh, described to them what we thought the uh, constitutional issues were with the practice and its unconstitutionality and why we thought it was unconstitutional. And I think minimally, even if you did work for the city, uh, you might want to bring that up. Now the question is after that, how far you would take it as a, in terms of a legal challenge, I guess you'd have to uh, put as a, a, I guess, a soul searching measure that you might have at a personal level. Right. Somebody wanted to know why you didn't argue that all the improvements, um, all the improvement was in the public right of way and not on pr uh, private property. The way a property ownership is described in South Dakota, property owners really own the property to the center of the street. So a lot of it was actually on our property. For instance, if, if there's an issue associated with uh, a landowner sewer line going out to the sewer line in the street, the landowner basically has to pay for any maintenance or rehabilitation, whatever that's required as a result of keeping their sewer line to the middle of the street maintained and operable. So it's it's a little different possibly here than it might be in the location of the question. Thanks, Ben. The next question is, is, if the whole area was disturbed by the water main installation, why wouldn't the replacements be part of the water main job? Special assessments for replacement appears to have been unnecessarily separated from the water main job. I'm not sure that I understand. Are they saying we, sh we should have been assessed for the street and water main? Is that um, if the whole area was disturbed by the water main installation, it's be part of. I think so, I think that's basically the, the point we were making in our case, in the sense that we did not feel that our curb and gutter, because of its condition, was required to be replaced. It was still functioning uh, and did not need to be replaced, and because of the city's decision to replace the water line, which led basically to street repavement and street replacement, they should have picked up the whole thing. And that was really one of the, I guess, the, the fundamental points of the case. In particular, for instance, if you remember the questioning and, and so forth around um, the particular pictures of curb and gutter uh, that I showed about the property that my wife and I own. You know, they, both the city engineer and the engineering technician said they could see no need for it to be replaced based upon its condition. But because the street and water line were being replaced, they were changing the elevation of the street. So consequently, they would have to change the elevation of the curb and particularly the gutter pan in order to allow drainage and facilitate drainage throughout the entire project. 
uh, because the elevation differences would have been different between my curb and gutter and the replaced curb and gutter had they not done that, even though the condition of my curb and gutter was good. But they still assessed me for its full value for the linear front foot cost. Okay, and I think you probably answered this question later in your presentation. Somebody wanted to know if the special assessment was repealed. It looks like it's going to be. They have not levied a special assessment. It, this, in this case, it was declared unconstitutional and invalid. The city has not levied special assessment for curb and gutter since this case was decided by the South Dakota Supreme Court. Actually, since it was uh, decided by the circuit court. They did have a bill in the legislature this year uh, to make some clarifications to uh, state statutes that allow for a citywide uh, street maintenance fee, street curb and gutter, gutter maintenance fee that they can assess to all landowners now to finance things like this for replacement and, and maintenance and so forth. Okay, so that speaks to another question that we got about what was final outcome. Did you still wind up having to pay the 965 or did they reassess or did they not assess at all? No, so they gave us our money back. They gave all of the assessees and petitioners our money back. They did not give the money back to the people who were not part a party to the case. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. Um, I'm sure there's other questions coming in, and I'll check back with those. But going, continuing down our list from earlier questions that were submitted, somebody wanted to know what type of legal team did the residents have? Was it a, like a constitutional legal team, a takings, land use, etc.? Well, uh, Mr. Hubbard is a neighbor that's one block down from me. The other attorney lives across the street on the same block. Mr. Hubbard is, is a relatively experienced attorney. He's been before the South Dakota Supreme Court several times and then made arguments uh, before them. He was an assistant attorney general uh, for the state of South Dakota for a while. The other attorney uh, that lives across the street from me, she is an assistant attorney general now and I think she is in charge of all appeals for the state. So both of them are very experienced attorneys. The attorney that we actually hired to do uh, the final arguments before the court and the final reviews and so forth of, of our draft uh, legal documents is also a very experienced attorney, probably 35 or minimum 35, 40 of experience. The other two attorneys are probably 30 plus years of experience also. I'm very familiar with the United States and the state constitution, as am I, although I'm not an attorney. <laughs> I do have a brother, I have an older brother that's an attorney and, my, and a nephew that's an attorney and I know lots of attorneys who talk about these things all the time and as you know Pepper, you know, we attend a lot of uh, legal training and so forth uh, to give us the background for these kinds of cases. And I attended many of those cases or many of those courses already. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. I'm sure that's helpful to them to know how you got in contact with somebody that had such great background and and knowledge. The next question um, kind of goes back to some earlier ones, but I think it has a little bit of a different twist. They said, your curb and gutter was intact and perfectly fine, but you showed pictures that many other locations were not in very good condition. Was the result of the lawsuit that the property owners with poor condition curb and gutters um, also did not have to pay the special assessment? And I think you mentioned that everybody that was in the lawsuit got their money back, but those that didn't join in the lawsuit were not refunded. Right. And basic, um, and and basically because I think a lot of that was because of the functioning curb and gutter, and particularly the gutter pan, because the city made such a case about 
damage from the water uh, to affected properties. But as long as the gutter pan was functioning, that could never occur. Okay. I think it's an it's an interesting, you know, um, thought about how it might have come down, how they might have determined if um, section, you know, segregated that out that based on condition. And I think that's what that question kind of asked, but that wasn't the way that the that the lawsuit went. So yes, um, I, do, not sure. I do think that brings up a, a very good point that had they approached properties differently and assessed different amounts based upon condition instead of the linear foot approach, their capes would have been much stronger. And particularly if they had used an appraiser to make those judgments. Now the real question that we always had in the back of our minds as, as assessees and people who were steering the case is how much, what would the administrative cost be for levying a fee like that uh, compared to what you know their costs were for doing it with the simple front foot method because you know they would have significantly higher costs uh, to administer than a, a special assessment using that method but it would have been I think a, a far more defendable method and frankly I was kind of surprised that they didn't do it that way when I met with city engineer and the city administrator and the mayor informally before this thing ever began it, I was kind of saying, well, you can't assess people with good curb and gutter the same amounts, but they wouldn't make any uh, adjustment or so forth based upon curb and gutter condition. Ben, we have about uh, three more questions and um, about five more minutes, roughly five, six more minutes to address them. The next question is, somebody wanted to know if individual real estate appraisals um, are needed to contest special benefits when the city says that uniform additional benefits are accruing to properties within the project? I think we've kind of implied that you have to treat, and, we, and I've stated specifically, you have to treat each property differently. And in South Dakota, the way the case law described how the benefits have to be, you know, at least a fair approximation of the assessment fee, I think that's leaning very closely toward that suggestion that an appraisal of some sort would have to be applied in order to make it valid. The implications are very strong that that's Okay. The next question is, municipalities assess homes and land based on a wide number of factors for taxes. This would seem a clear way to define individual benefits for some capital improvements, as, um, such as the provisions of water and sewer. It would also suggest that because homes with sewer and water are taxed at a higher rate, that, uh, let's see, yeah. There's a question that I think it said, would it also suggest that because homes with water and sewer are taxed at a higher rate, that such higher rates should cover the maintenance costs, including uh, related gutter rep replacement? That's kind of what we were thinking as assessees. Uh, the, the property taxation in the city of Pier is, is not low. Uh, we don't have a lot of other types of taxes in the state of South Dakota. We have a uh, sales tax, which picks up a lot of, of the state's revenue. Uh, we have no income tax. And the property tax is the tax that's basically used to, to finance education and most local government functions. I was surprised, in the one, and prior to this uh, assessment, I was unaware that the city was actually doing special assessments with the type of curve I, you know, I don't attend a lot of the city meetings, and I was surprised by it. There's only two cities that we were aware of after we began this litigation in the state of South Dakota that, that actually did assess uh, per linear foot per curve and 
other. One was, one was the city of Pier, the other was the city of Fort Pier. Uh, none of the other cities in the state uh, that we were aware of, and I actually did some uh, informal uh, inquiries of my planning colleagues across the state, who, most of whom I know pretty well because of the number of years I've lived here, and none of them did it, nor were they aware of anyone else that did it. And as we discussed earlier, uh, I'm also affiliated with this 14 state association, and we have a listserv that we use quite often for inquiries related to issues like this. And I also use the listserv to ask those other states if they've ever heard of things like this uh, or linear front footage, total cost replacement, and none of them had ever heard of it either. Great. Ben, we've got just a couple more questions, see if we can get through those in the next couple minutes, and then we'll give Cody a chance to put up um, how to log your CM slides, and, and we'll wrap up the webinar here. It says, while this issue was making its way through the court system, what was the general mood of the class of assessees when it came to applying for unrelated permits, for instance, residential additions or accessory buildings? Did they tend to delay those plans until after the matter was resolved? Or I think they mean, did the city, did they, uh, or no, they, they mean the property owners, did they file those permit applications with the expectation that the curb and gutter issue would be kept separate from those applications? Yes. And the city of, of Pier was totally fair and unbiased in any of those types of decisions. There's no question that they performed their municipal functions with the utmost integrity. Great to hear, Ben. Did you, somebody else wanted to know, did you live in a special uh, sewer district that is taxed differently? No, I do not. Okay. And then the last question is, what if the city would have required property owners to pay for improvements out of their pockets versus being assessed? Would you have still challenged the requirement? Uh, depends on whether they were to require me to pay for them. <laughs> Had mine been in the same condition that it was uh, at that time, I certainly could have seen no reason uh, for me to replace mine. Now, had they changed the elevation differences uh, and so forth and caused, say, my property to be flooded as a result of my property having a lower elevation than adjacent properties or something, I might have sued them uh, for basically destroying the value of my existing curve and gutter, or I might have at least thought about it uh, because of the decisions they made that would have, I guess, imperiled the function of uh, the curve and gutter that I had at that time. It would have been, a, a, I think, a very similar impact to um, a curb and gutter a, a special assessment because it's, it's basically the same. They would be taking the function, if nothing else, of your existing curb and gutter by doing that, by making that decision. Great. I appreciate your time today. Um, I'd like to very much thank Cody for providing some technical support uh, on this webinar and definitely thank Ben Orsman for his presentation and all his hard work on this, um, this project. For those that were attending, we did get a lot of comments that it was difficult to hear. For some of you, we're hoping that the recording of the session um, didn't have the same audio problems that some of you were experiencing. That will be posted. Cody, correct me if I'm wrong, you'll have that up sometime next week on the Utah APA website. So I guess um, I'd encourage those of you that had a difficult time hearing the entire presentation to revisit the recording and perhaps you'll be able to pick up um, some of the information that you, that you might have missed today. Um, so, Ben, thank you again so much for helping out the Western Central Chapter with uh, providing this valuable information to the other planners around the country, and thank those of you who joined us today. Cody or Ben, do you have any last wrap-up items? 
uh, I thank you all for allowing me to present this information. Um, I am planning on writing a, uh, a short paper associated with this topic that will probably be published in the Western uh, Planner Journal sometime uh, within the next year. So uh, those a written description may be available also. Okay, um, I'll just, yes, yes, thank you, Ben, and thank you, Pepper. Um, I'll just go through a few of the closing remarks, and then we can end the session. Um, so for those of you still in attendance, um, I'll just go over on how to log your SIEM credits. As you can see here, um, you'll just need to go to www.planning.org slash CM, select activities by date, and then underneath today's date, uh, Friday, March 18th, you'll see special assessments, assessments create special benefits, avoiding an unconstitutional taking. And this is listed underneath the Western Central Chapter. Um, it is up already, so um, once you click out of here, you can go and log those credits. And then, as Pepper was saying um, earlier, we are recording today's session, so for those of you that did have audio problems, be sure to check out um, the video recording and a PDF of today's presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast dash archive. And this should be up by Monday. So um, I'll leave this up, and so you guys can copy this down. And thanks again for today's session. Thank you very much, Cody. And just a reminder th to those of you that are still on, this was approved for 1.5 CMs of law credits. So in case, that, in case we neglected to mention that earlier. Yes, thank you. Thanks again, Ben and Cody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. And that will conclude the webinar.